Hey guys, Dan here with this week's uh, movie reviews. Uh, a bunch of movies actually have come out in the last two weeks or so um, that are pretty high profile. Um, three of the four uh, were slated for a theatrical release. I'm not quite sure about the fourth one, but um, two of them you can stream for free right now if you have Amazon Prime, which is pretty cool. And then uh, the other two you can rent at all your usual places, Vudu, uh, iTunes, Amazon for 20 bucks. So we'll get to all of it. Um, and yeah, let's let's talk about it. I, I wasn't sure what order to even do these and usually I go from highest profile to um, sort of the more obscure ones, I guess. Um, and there's two, I think, that, that really would have done pretty well at the box office. My Spy starring Dave Bautista um, and then Irresistible with Steve Carell, which is uh, written and directed by Jon Stewart. So I think we're going to start there. Um, I think My Spy probably would have done better theatrically, but uh, I think Irresistible would have been maybe the one that more people were talking about. So let's start there. Um, it's, uh, like I said, written and directed by uh, the wonderful Jon Stewart, who, of course, used to host The Daily Show for a long time, uh, and also directed the movie Rosewater, which was really, really good a few years ago. Um... But uh, this one you can get for $19.99 to rent for uh, 48 hours at your usual sites. Um, this is sort of inspired, actually, by a true story from uh, 2017 where uh, Georgia had a special election uh, and there were $55 million spent combined uh, on the two parties, which became the most uh, expensive House congressional election in U.S. history. But uh, in, in this version, we have Steve Carell playing a Democratic strategist, um, and Rose Byrne playing a Republican strategist, and they sort of vied against each other in the 2016 presidential election, and here they are now doing it uh, again in... Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it really says what town it is. It's not Georgia, though. It's somewhere like in the Midwest, like in the heartland. Uh, but basically he helps a retired veteran played by Chris Cooper run for uh, mayor of this small town, and uh, Rose Byrne's character hears about it and kind of comes, comes down and uh, tries to work her magic with the Republican candidate. Um, does it say here? Wisconsin. Yeah, I knew it was De Deer Lakin or Deer Lacken was the name of the town. They, they said that several times throughout the movie, but I couldn't remember what state it was in. Wisconsin, apparently, is uh, the state. And I will also point out Chris Cooper's daughter here, played by um, Mackenzie Davis. Uh, really, really good. I mean, she's been in... I've seen her in a few different things. Um, she was in that awkward moment, The Martian, uh, the most recent Blade Runner movie, um, and then she also played uh, a super soldier in Terminator Dark Fate, which is, I guess, where I most recently saw her, but uh, she's one of the best parts of this movie. And then there's a bunch of sort of, um, you know, B and C listers uh, that, that fill out the cast. Topher Grace, Deborah Messing has a very small role, uh, Will Sasso from Mad TV, Natasha Leone. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty star-studded event here, um, but does the movie work? Um, you know, I... Love John Stewart. I miss John Stewart, uh, and I love I love Trevor Noah too. But um, I actually got rid of cable right around the same time Trevor Noah took over for The Daily Show. So I've seen a lot of clips from the Trevor Noah version of The Daily Show, but I haven't watched a lot of full episodes. Uh, although I do love his book Born a Crime. But uh, John Stewart, man, I was I watched The Daily Show every single night for at least 10 or 12 years when John Stewart was hosting The Daily Show. I watched that show constantly. Um, and I, I loved it. I miss him a lot. I love whenever he pops up on Colbert. Um, and like I said earlier, I really like the movie Rosewater that uh, Stewart did. Stewart is very love him or hate him, though. He, you know, can, can come at people very strong because he is very intelligent. He's very well read, um, you know, and if he goes on you know, like a Fox News show, he can sort of eviscerate uh, the host, you know, got a very sharp wit about him. Um, but of course, he's got detractors as well. A lot of people hate him because of that, because they don't maybe share his uh, same political views or they're, you know, very hardcore Fox News fans or whatever. Um, but the one thing I don't think I've ever been able to really say about Jon Stewart until this movie is that he is safe, maybe even borderlining on boring. Um, you know, this is sort of a satire in some ways. Uh, it's, it's really listed as a political comedy, not a political satire. But the last, like, maybe 20 minutes or so, and sort of sprinkled throughout, there's these, like, pockets of very, very satirical stuff 
that to me didn't gel with the rest of the movie. Like, um, you know, going after CNN and their whole, you know, 12 talking heads at one time, you know, and it's like, okay, first of all, we've seen that done before on, on other things, um, but it's just, it's not sharp, you know, to me that's not, it's, it's kind of satirical. A, it doesn't mix with the rest of the movie, but all right, you know, I get the satire, but it's just not that clever. Um, and, and I definitely expect more from, from Jon Stewart with that. Um, and even, like, th some of the references make the movie dated immediately. Like, because we're starting um, off with the some of the previous elections, and we have a whole montage over the opening credits of um, political figures that became presidents doing what they do, you know, schmoozing the, the crowd at, at a restaurant or, or whatever. And they showed back to, I think George H.W. Bush was the first one they showed. I don't think they went back to Reagan. But, you know, Bush, Clinton, um, other Bush, Obama, Trump, um, and some of their running, uh, not running mates, but some of their um, opponents as well. They showed uh, Al, Al Gore. Um, they showed... Um, Oh, the guy that he used to hold the pen all the time in the 96 election. Um, oh, Norm MacDonald played him on SNL. Anyway, I can't remember. But Bob Dole, that's it. Um, so, you know, th that was sort of setting the, the stage for what this is okay going to be. Like, I got it. We're going to have uh, this Chris Cooper character, you know, try and schmooze people, whatever. The daughter opposes it. All right, fine. It's fairly standard. But right away, like in the second or third scene... Uh, Steve Carell makes a reference to Joe the Plumber. Now, Joe the Plumber was a, you know, sort of character. I mean, he was a real person, but he was kind of a character that Sarah Palin glommed onto um, in the 2012 election. Um, you know, people that are super into politics will remember Joe the Plumber, but I don't think your average person will. I actually referenced Joe the Plumber maybe two or three years ago, and whoever I was talking to was like, what are you talking about? What's Joe the Plumber? So, and they were a political person. So, um, you know, so I, I think that sort of makes the, the movie dated almost immediately. But um, also, this movie criminally underuses Rose Byrne. She shows up in that very, very opening scene before the credits, but then we don't see her for the next 44 minutes of the movie. Um, and then when she does appear, you know, her sort of back and forth bickering with Steve Carell, um, there's just not a lot to it. It's not very... Um, clever, you know, I, I keep saying that word because I expect clever from Jon Stewart. I accept, I, I expect some sort of highbrow satire. I expect things that this movie was not. And I'm not saying this movie is terrible. It's certainly watchable. Um, and, you know, Chris Cooper's always good. Like I said, the, the daughter, Mackenzie Davis uh, plays the daughter. She's great in this movie for sure. And Rose Byrne is, is great as well. She's never not. Um, Steve Carell is good. And, of course, you know, him and John Stewart go way back from the early days of uh, Stewart's hosting of The Daily Show. So, you know, that's great. But um, there was just such gentle lobs thrown in here with the satire and the jokes. Um, also, I think you could have maybe done this movie as a PG-13. It's It's got a lot of language that makes it R. Um, but, like, it reminds me a little bit of the movie Swing State with uh, Kelsey Grammer and Kevin Costner, I think it is. Um, and that was, as far as I remember, a PG-13 movie. I, th I think you could you could do sort of a, a PG-13 version of this because here's the thing. If you wanted to make it R-rated, give it more bite. Give it more of, of the satire element. Give it more of the hardcore political commentary that Jon Stewart is known for. This is not that. Um, I, I will say, though, I do like how... It's nonpartisan. You know, I, I think a lot of people, when they think of Jon Stewart, think, okay, hardcore liberal, you know. And, look, that's probably true. It didn't really start coming through till I think, towards the end of The Daily Show, more than anything. But um, but I think it's safe to say he is a, a Democrat and a liberal. But uh, this movie doesn't really reflect that, and I, I definitely like that aspect of it. It really is sort of taking apart the whole political machine and the ridiculousness of the super PACs and the, the fundraisers and all of that kind of thing, and that's on both sides of the aisle, and this movie reflects that. So I definitely like that part of it, um, but it just was, was way too safe for what I was expecting from a Jon Stewart political film. Um, and so I, I think, unfortunately... People that don't like Jon Stewart, people that are like really heavy conservative, I think will stay away from it 
because of the Jon Stewart name, even though it is not a partisan movie, I didn't think. Um, you know, it really is kind of skewering both angles. It's, it's really skewering the machine of politics. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly expected more from this movie. I leave Irresistible with a C. Um, so next, let's talk about My Spy. This is uh, the Dave Bautista movie that um, I think actually would have probably done pretty well at the box office. He's really at this point trying to be um, an action star, I guess. I mean, we, we've seen it now between uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Of course, he's a little more reserved in that movie. Uh, in his character, he you know fights a lot, but he's more more soft spoken I guess then we had Stuber last year with uh, Kumail Anjani which was to me very disappointing uh, and now we've got uh, another one called My Spy this is basically his version of Kindergarten Cop you know every action star I guess has to do one of these as they move along you know for uh, The Rock I suppose maybe it was The Tooth Fairy uh, or maybe it was Get Smart um Eh, there weren't really kids in Get Smart, though. You, you got you to gotta have the kid element. So I guess maybe it was the Tooth Fairy for The Rock. Um, but uh, this one is Batista's. He plays JJ, um, who is a former Special uh, Forces soldier, now working for the CIA as an operative. Him and uh, his partner, played by Christian Shaw. Bobby is uh, her name here. She's sort of the tech specialist um, in, in uh, JJ's circle there. Um, but... He is not a great CIA agent. He, he blows his first mission um, due to some transparency issues uh, with, with the Russians. So his boss, uh, David Kim, who is played by Ken Jeong, oddly uh, low-key. Usually Ken Jeong is way over the top and, and really kind of annoying. Uh, and here he actually was pretty low-key. He actually had some, some funny lines, too. Uh, and I don't, I don't hate Ken Jeong. You know, I watched The Masked Singer. He's, he's sort of funny to... to you know, joke around with and laugh at on that show. He sort of plays the clown in Mass Singer, but in a lot of his movie reels, he's just way over the top, and uh, he didn't do that here. But anyway, so basically, uh, he wants JJ and uh, his partner Robbie to keep an eye on this uh, in law family member of uh, Victor Marquez, who is a, a French illegal arms dealer. Um, and as a result, JJ ends up bonding with the niece of uh, the lady. Or, well, the niece of the guy that they're after, but the daughter of the lady that they're kind of spying on. Uh, Sophie is her name. Chloe Coleman is the little actress. Um, and basically, she blackmails JJ into training her because she finds uh, one of their little spy cameras very, very early on in the mission and uh, kind of busts them for it and is like, okay, well, I won't tell my mom that you're doing this if you, you know, basically train me to be like you basically be my buddy, you know, she's, she's got no father, I guess, um, and they're in a new town, she's struggling to make friends at school, so she figures let's make friends with uh, good old Dave Batista over here. Um, so, this movie uh, was also kind of disappointing, we're sensing a theme here. Uh, first of all, you can get this movie for free on Prime Video, which I think is awesome. I really like that um, some of these major companies are buying some of the would-be theatrical releases, um, like Netflix bought The Lovebirds, and Disney Plus bought Hamilton, and um, the new Tom Hanks movie is going to be on Apple TV Plus in a couple of weeks for free. So I think that's really cool. So this you can get for free on Amazon Prime. Um, so my biggest issue with this movie is it has no idea, zero clue, what kind of movie it is or wants to be. And to be honest, as an adult, Kindergarten Cop had the same issues. I didn't quite see it when I was a kid. That movie came out when I was like 13, I think. Um, I thought that there was an odd shift in Kindergarten Cop, like halfway through the movie. It went from sort of jokey kids movie to like really dark, you know, action movie. Um, this never quite makes that, you know, straight up shift, but it's bouncing back and forth basically the whole movie. So, so it has that going on. Um, the chemistry is, is great between Batista and uh, Chloe. Um, I actually think she's a really good little actress. I don't know if she's in the right movie because I think uh, we could experience her acting chops a little bit better in a different film maybe. But look, she's supposed to be cute. She's supposed to be a little, a little tough girl. She pulls that off. Um, Batista, I'm still back and forth on. I'm not sure. I mean, I love him in the Guardians movies. Didn't know much about him at all before that. Like, I 
you know, don't watch wrestling, at least not for the last, you know, 25, 30 years. So I don't know a lot of the people. But, of course, I knew The Rock I knew before Dwayne Johnson became a big actor. I knew who Steve Austin was before he started dabbling in acting. Batista I didn't really know anything about. So Guardians was kind of my first exposure to him. Stuber, um, I think him and Kumail Nanjiani were okay in, but it was just not a good movie, not not a real good vehicle for the two of them. This, I think, is definitely a better vehicle for him. Um, and I did get a few laughs from him, but sadly the laughs weren't really from him at all, or really from her. Um, they were sort of from the side characters. I had some laughs from Christian Shaw. Um, I had, you know, some laughs. Like, uh, he, he went to sort of a parent's job day, like, show-and-tell type thing at the school, and the women that worked there were, like, all fawning over him. Like, that was kind of funny. But I think maybe I only got one laugh from, from a Dave Batista line specifically. Um, but also, like, this movie is, is for two different audiences that, that never mix. Like, it's it's for families, I guess, ideally, but it's definitely for families with older kids, older than the girl in the movie, who is, like, 9 or 10, um, I would say it's for, like, 13 and up. Like, it's... I mean, it's PG-13, but I wouldn't recommend... Like, there's definitely... Like, a lot of the superhero movies, I could be like, all right, like, an 8-year-old could watch that for sure. But, like, they have, like, a Cardi B song unedited in this movie, which I don't... I, it's so easy for movies to get edited versions of songs. I don't know why they did that. Um, you know, and, and then there's just too much violence or cursing for, like, a family with young kids to, I think, enjoy together, but then it's also a little too tame for action fans. Like, I don't think a 20-year-old action, action fan um, that's a dude is necessarily going to love this movie, and maybe they wouldn't gravitate it to begin with because it looks too childlike because of the little girl. So it's like, it's a movie kind of at odds with itself, I guess. Um, and it's interesting because I, I looked at the director... Um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, and some of, like, his other movies. Um, I just, I lost the page. Um, and my internet's being a butthole today, by the way. Um, but anyway, so, alright, maybe I'll just... Anyway, the director has directed, like, other things that I was just like, alright, that doesn't necessarily give itself to a kid's movie, I don't think, you know. Um... But then the writer is somebody who has more experience in that other realm. So it's like, just the, the two of them didn't really seem to come to a consensus on what this movie wanted to be. And so the movie just is sort of at odds with itself because of that. Um, and it's, it's really kind of a bummer. Peter Siegel is the director. And so, okay, here's what he's done. He's done... Uh, oh, no, okay, so he's, he's the one that's done more comedy stuff. So he did... He directed Com Tommy Boy, Nutty Professor 2, Fifty First Dates, Get Smart, speaking of which. Um, and the, the writers were John and Eric Hober, um, and they don't have their own wiki, so I don't know what they did, but let's, let's see. Let's see what they did um, on IMDb. Um, oh, so, okay, right, so they've done the action stuff. They did Battleship, Red, the Meg. So you've got that meets, you know, Nutty Professor to the Clumps, and it's just like, it's not mixing. Um, so I, I don't think My Spy is horrible. I actually liked it better than Stuber. Um, but it just has no clue what it is. So much like the Jon Stewart movie, um, I, I leave this one with a C as well. So up next, we're going to talk about 7500. This is starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt. This one is free on Amazon Prime as well. So if you're an Amazon Prime member, you're really uh, getting to watch the, the, the free uh, movies here. This did get actually released um, in a couple of places uh, before the pandemic. And uh, I guess it was supposed to be released in theaters here too at some point. But um, Amazon bought the rights and uh, are, are gonna, you know, gonna give it to us for free, which is so nice. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, which, by the way, this is his first movie in years. I didn't realize that this, um, I guess just because, I don't know, you know, he's always kind of in the mix, you know, but um, this is his first movie since Snowden, which was four years ago, I think, um, where he played Edward Snowden. So, um, 
you know, first of all, welcome back, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Uh, but this is really one of those movies where he is not only, like, front and center, the main star, but he's one of the only stars of this movie. Um, so basically, he is a pilot on this flight um, from Berlin to Paris. He plays an American, um, so he's not, like, trying to do, you know, an accent or whatever, but his, his co-pilot is, I think, German, either German or Parisian, but... Um, but anyway, terrorists try to seize control of this plane, um, and so, you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is basically alone because his, his co-pilot gets knocked out almost immediately, and so he's basically trying to save the lives of the passengers and the crew, and also he's having an affair with one of the, uh, you know, the flight attendants, so he's got sort of a personal stake in this as well. Um, so, really, it's, you know, he is... Like I said, not only front and center, but the entire movie, more or less, takes place in the cockpit of this plane. So, it's largely in real time. I don't think it's completely in real time, but I, I, I think it's for the most part in real time, which I always like. I, I think it's a great technique that doesn't get used enough, because I think it's hard to use it properly. It's, it's hard to keep something interesting in real time for 90 minutes. Um, and especially in such a very con confined space. I mean, we've got, you know, a, a cockpit is not large. Um, and eventually, eh, I don't want to give spoilers, I guess, but um, one of the, I guess it happens about halfway through the movie, one, one of the people trying to hijack the plane does make their way into the cockpit. And actually, it's, no, it's definitely before the halfway mark because that's how the guy gets knocked out. Um, so for a lot of the movie... There's three people in this very, very small little cockpit area. Um, and so the, the director, Patrick uh, Volrath, has had a couple of things that, you know, I, I'm not real familiar with, but he was nominated uh, for a live-action short film uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, he, he's got mostly, like, German-type films under his belt. Um, and Everything Will Be Okay was the name of the, the short film, if you're a follower of the Academy Awards and remember that name, but um, but this is his first, like, real big-budget American film, um, and I, I guess it's sort of like American-German hybrid film, but, you know, with an American cast and stuff. Um, I mean, Joseph Gordon-Levitt really is one of only about nine people with speaking roles in the entire movie. Like, we don't really ever hear from the, um, the passengers, for the most part, um, because we never really explore outside. There is a, a monitor in the cockpit where he can see what's going on outside, but really it's still like just directly outside the cockpit. Um, so this movie um, f definitely falls apart by the end. You know, I think there's some elements of the movie that um, sort of about an hour, hour and maybe ten minutes into the movie, we sort of, the story sort of resolves itself. Um, and then we keep going because other things sort of transpire. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt forms sort of an unlikely uh, friendship with this guy, you know, since they've, they've been in the cockpit now for over an hour and sort of learning about each other and stuff. Um, because at the same time, you know, he's still got to fly this plane, so the guy's obviously not going to kill him. Um, I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt gives... Uh, another great performance. He's one of my favorite actors, really. I mean, um, I think I think he could easily be the next like Leo DiCaprio, the next you know Brad Pitt, um, because he's he's chosen such interesting roles over the last you know ten fifteen years. Going back to, I mean, obviously you know he started on TV, but I mean his first, some of his first movie roles, you know, Brick and Five Hundred Days of Summer and mysterious skin and you know they, they were all very interesting and, and very unlike each other you know I, I think he could have the career Johnny Depp should have had if he didn't start doing all those pirates movies and stuff you know um, so I think he gives another great performance here um, I could go on all day about you know the, the interesting roles of Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, I just wish it was able to indeed hold our interest for that 90 minute time span um, because I think by the end of the movie, the plot definitely falls apart. The story falls apart, which means it doesn't have a great ending. I say all the time, 
Um, you know, sometimes a, a horrible ending can really ruin a, a, an otherwise real good movie. I'm not sure if this movie falls in the real good camp to begin with, but um, I think for being as interesting as it is being shot in just that one little area, the cockpit, um, you got to give it credit for that and so, some great performances for sure. Um, so I'm going to leave 7,500 with a B. I, I think it definitely um, can can serve well for what it is, but um, unfortunately it does kind of fall apart there by the end. Um, so finally we're going to talk about You Should Have Left. This is a horror movie that uh, was going to be released in theaters in June, I think, um, this month. And instead they scrapped it all together and said, nope, let's put it up for rental so you can get this uh, on Amazon Prime and the other outlets for $19.99 to rent. Um, it's actually based on uh, a book, which I've not heard of, a, a thriller book from 2017 of the same name, uh, and it is directed by David Cope or Kep. I'm never sure how to pronounce his name, but uh, he's been he's done so many movies. Um, you know, going back to the 90s, he he's written a lot of movies, um, including you know he has a writing credit on Jurassic Park for one thing. Um, and the first Mission Impossible, but he's also directed uh, some interesting movies, Ghost Town with Ricky Gervais, which is uh, you know a, a PG-13 comedy, uh, Premium Rush. Speaking of Joseph Gordon-Levitt and some interesting roles, he directed that, which yeah, I thought that was okay. Uh, and speaking of Johnny Depp and horrible movies, he directed Mordecai. So uh, you know this guy's definitely a little bit up and down, you know. But uh, Kevin Bacon stars in this, and he directed Kevin about uh, 20 years ago in Stir of Echoes, uh, which was another horror movie that uh, is a little bit all over the place, but certainly, I think, better than this one. Um, and basically, Kevin Bacon plays uh, a former banker um, who was accused of murdering his wife um, and, you know, got acquitted on the court side, but public opinion still thinks, no, no, this guy's a scumbag, he did kill his wife. Um, and his wife, who is an actress, played by Amanda Seyfried, and uh, their daughter together, uh, played by Avery Essex. This is a film with only five actors all together. Um, well, I guess that's not true. There's five actors listed, but I think there's maybe seven in the whole movie. Maybe. But it's one of those where um, it's re they're really not... Not many actors in this, uh, but we do see early on uh, Amanda Seyfried is sort of on set somewhere, so there's some extras floating about, and uh, Kevin Bacon's character tries to get on set, and they don't let him. Um, he thinks because the guy, um, you know, with the headset recognizes him. Uh, so he plays Theo, Amanda Seyfried plays Susanna, so they basically want to get away, and they decide to rent this little house for a while. They rent it online, so we don't see any realtors either, but they get to the house, and uh, it looks great on the surface, but uh, everything is, oh my god, not what it seems. Um, and slowly but surely, we have uh, Theo sort of exploring the house at night. He has this sort of journal he's been writing in that his therapist suggested, and the journal uh, is starting to have some mysterious entries in it that he doesn't remember writing. So what are they from? Are they from you know, her. Uh, and at the same time, she is maybe having an affair with somebody uh, from the movie set. And maybe, oh, we find out, yes, she sure is. But it's pretty obvious right from the start, so I wouldn't even say that's a spoiler. Um, but anyway, uh, as we go on here, we find this house really, really is not what it seems. There are uh, hidden passageways. Uh, it is... Um, it measures more on the inside than it does on the outside or maybe it's vice versa but anyway the measurements are not the same on the inside and the outside of the house which is very odd uh he goes into town at one point to try and get some basic stuff you know to make food and whatever and the guy at the old feed store is just like oh you're in that house you know um so uh this movie does not really have a ton of chills i would say um but here's the thing like i think it has a horrible grade on rotten i think it's like 11 percent or 12 percent on rotten tomatoes i think it's getting like slammed i don't think it's quite that bad um but what i think about this movie is that it's got a lot of interesting pieces 
um, that just don't quite end up connecting. Um, and I think you could say the same with a lot of horror movies, but I think this is better than the one Kevin Bacon did like three or four years ago. Um, was it The Pyramid? I think that was an F. Whatever it was, I gave it an F. I didn't like it. I don't think it was The Pyramid, but I did give that an F too. Um, it was another horror movie. I, horror movies, I think, are some of the easiest movies to give Fs to because either they scare you or they don't. Either they have good acting or they don't. Either, you know, they're inventive or they're not. You know, it's like, if, if it doesn't have any of those pieces, it's, it's pretty easy to fail it because its main point is to scare you. Um, I think this has some genuinely creepy tension. Um, but one of the things about this movie is the Amanda Seyfried character almost is superfluous. Like, she doesn't really even need to exist. Um, by the end of the movie, they bring her character arc back around, and it and you're like, okay, I guess maybe she's important. But, like, realistically, this could just be Kevin Bacon and his daughter, and you wouldn't need uh, the Seyfried character at all. So I thought that was a bit odd. I mean, I guess the, the, the subplot with her having the affair does play in a bit. Um, but I'm not sure how much, you know, I, I think they maybe could have even done it without her. So, um, but, but Kevin Bacon and the daughter, uh, I think have some interesting moments, like halfway through the story, um, when the Seyfried character vacates the house cause she's had enough. I, I hate like giving even semi spoilers on my, on my channel, but I don't know. Um, it's it, it's sort of this movie is so sort of by the books it's like if you can't see that coming I don't know but um, but once she vacates I think the storyline gets a lot more interesting between you know Theo his daughter and the house you know this is one of the movies where like the house is a character um, but it just it, it just the sum of the parts just don't come together you know as as a cohesive whole but um, I thought this movie was all right I I wouldn't recommend it as a horror movie. I think there's certainly better ones, um, although this year has not been kind of horror movies. I've already graded several of them in the D and F range. This one does not go to those depths, for sure, because um, I do think the design of the house is interesting. Again, you know, we, we've seen, you know, mysterious houses before, um, but uh, I think there's, there's some interesting, like, set design choices because of that. Um, and there's some, some interesting notions floated that maybe don't come to pass. Um, but I'm going to leave You Should Have Left uh, with a C-. minus. So nothing real super great this week. I think 75 is certainly the best of the bunch. Um, I, you know, I, I think none of these movies are horrible. I think if you're in the right mood for something of that genre, I think you could do worse. Uh, the problem with My Spy is it doesn't quite know what genre it is. Um, but I think for a family movie with older kids, it's fine. Uh, you'll get a few laughs from it. Uh, you know, the John Stewart one, I, I just wish was was more cutting, I guess, or more sharp cl or clever than uh, than it turned out being. So that's it for this week. Uh, next week, I think we're going to have another uh, Netflix run of movies because there's at least four that have been uh, new lately, including this new Will Ferrell one that uh, people are talking about. So I think that'll be next week. And then the week after that, we'll do Hamilton. We'll do the new Tom Hanks one that's going to be on Apple TV Plus by then. Um, so we definitely have a few more weeks, at least in us, of, uh, of new movie reviews for uh, On Demand and streaming. So thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you back here next week for more movie reviews. In the meantime, we're going to have a uh, Dan Does Disney movie review with uh, my good buddy Joe. We're going to talk about Cinderella. That was over an hour of spirited discussion about Cinderella that uh, we'll get up here over the next few days, and then, uh, of course, I have TV reviews coming up, too. So uh, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.